Good evening, gentlemen. Hey, we have a few of you that were here last week, and I promised you last week that this week you get to tell us how wonderful it was confessing to your brother. So anybody that's willing to step out, you don't have to tell us what you confess, not the problem, but how did that impact you in that prayer time? Go for it. <laughs> Go for it. So in my case, my brother, uh, we made connection a couple times during the week just to make sure we was praying over each other by, by those individual things that we, uh, we asked each other to pray on. So it was a good, always always a good time to pray for each other, period. Put it in action. Yeah, put it in action. Anybody else have any comments? If you forgot what you did, you don't need to bother comments. All right. Well, we'll jump in tonight, and we are beginning First John, and I'm not going to tell you anything about John because I'm pretty sure I told you all about John before. But we were teaching John. And if you need to know anything, go for it. And as is my custom, oops, let's go ahead and read the whole chapter, and then we'll break it down and look at a few verses at a time. We're also going to be using, because of my love of the Tree of Life translation, you're going to get a bit of Hebrew tonight, and I'm sure you all know who Yeshua is. Pastor Jim? Yes, sir. Did you, you meant First Peter, right? What did I say? I said John, John didn't I? Okay. I even elaborated on that. No, First Peter. First Peter was one. 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 What did we do last week? James Five. James Five, yeah. You know, one of those guys that I got with Jesus. <laughs> We're going with Peter tonight. Yes, that is. I did actually, and you probably know this if you were last week, I ended up starting three different teachings before I finally got the right chapter. <laughs> so, at least I've only missed it tonight instead of having the wrong one. All righty. Uh, my question was, you all know who Yeshua is? Yes. Okay. We won't explain that one to you. And hopefully you know him on many levels. But the Tree of Life version that I use, and I don't think I've talked about it once before, but it's basically a Hebrew version of looking at Jesus. And that's sort of an oversimplification, but Every translation is complicated, and every translation is an interpretation of the Bible. And this is one of my favorites because it gives a different perspective. It's more of a Jewish than a Greek because most of the translations first went to Latin and or Greek of the New Testament. This one did, to some extent, I mean you have to, go to Greek to get New Testament. So you're not getting it in Hebrew, but you are getting a Jewish perspective on it. And they do throw in some random words. Alrighty, and if I hit one of those, I'll tell you what it is. One of my least favorite things about this version is that sometimes there's an odd choice of a combination of Hebrew and English and we'll be doing one of those a lot tonight. When I say Yeshua, and it's the Christ, it's HaMashiach in the Hebrew, but in this version of the Bible, they actually say Yeshua the Messiah, which seems a little strange to me. All right, this chapter is long and it's full of great stuff. So let's go ahead and get rolling. Starting with verse one. Peter, an emissary of Mashiach, Yeshua, Mashiach, Yeshua, I can't talk, to the sojourners of the diaspora in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, set apart by the Ruach, which is spirit, for obedience and for sprinkling with blood of Yeshua HaMashiach. May grace and shalom be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua Mashiach. In his great mercy, he caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Mashiach Yeshua 
from the dead. An incorruptible, undefiled, and unfading inheritance has been reserved in heaven for you. By trusting, you are being protected by God's power for the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this greatly, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. These trials are so that the true metal of your faith, far more valuable than gold which perishes than refined by fire, may come to light in praise and glory and honor at the revelation the Mashiach Yeshua. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you don't see him now, you trust him and are filled with a joy that is glorious beyond words, receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The prophets who spoke about the grace that was to be yours searched for this salvation and investigated carefully. They were trying to find out the time and circumstance the Ruach of Hamashiach within them was indicated, but predicting the sufferings in store for Mashiach and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were providing these messages not to themselves, but to you. These messages have now been announced to you through those who proclaim the good news to you by the Ruach HaKodesh sent from heaven. Even angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. So brace your minds for action. Keep your balance and set your hope completely on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach. Like obedient children, do not be shaped by the cravings you had formerly in your ignorance. Instead, just like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in everything you do. For it is written, Kedoshim, you shall be, for I am Kedosh. And that is the be holy for I am holy. If you call on him as father, the one who judges impartially according to each one's needs, then live out the time of sojourning in reverent fear. You know that you were redeemed from the feudal way of life handed down from your ancestors, not with perishable things such as silver or gold but with precious blood like that of a lamb without defect or spot, the blood of Mashiach. He was chosen before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your trust and hope were in God. Now that you have purified your souls in obedience to the truth, leading to sincere brotherly love, Love one another fervently from a pure heart. You have been born again, not from perishable seed, but imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all humanity is like grass, and all its glory like a wildflower. The grass withers and the flowers fall off, but the word of the Lord <coughs> endures forever. And this is the word that was proclaimed as good news to you. Unfortunately, this is going to be longer than I thought because I apparently did not use my normal font. I did not read it as well as normal. Let's get back to verses 1 and 2. Peter and Emissary of Mashiach Yeshua to the sojourners of the Diaspora in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, Bithynia, excuse me. Chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, set apart by the Ruach for obedience and for sprinkling with the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach. May grace and shalom be multiplied to you. Now, if that was all we had, it could fill the teaching tonight. And I sort of wish it was because we're going to blitz through the last part. And I've got a fair amount here I want you to see. In verse 1, we see two English words that likely are different in your translation. Let's take a peek at those. And understand, I'm not trying to sell you on getting the version that I now use more often than others. I don't want to push any version over another, and we all have our favorites. But I do want to encourage you to read in as many versions as you can, because as I said earlier, every translation is an interpretation. 
and multiple interpretations of the same words are more likely to get, to get you closer to the true meaning. I do believe, and we in this church believe in the inerrancy of God's word, but I do not believe in the inerrancy of our word, which basically includes all humans' interpretation of his word. And I think P.D. gets to that point fairly often by saying he believes in the inerrancy of scripture in the original autographs in the original languages. Uh, I know he said that privately a few times, and I'm pretty sure he said it publicly more than once. So if you haven't heard that, now you have. The truth that we're seeking is a person, Jesus Christ. It's not a proposition of logic. And that is important to remember. We've also cut down on the number of arguments you have over the finer points of theology. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth, according to John 16, 13. And I encourage you, and encourage myself, to always ask God to lead us into the truth when we read His Word, and not assume that our brains are going to do the job for us and give us what we need. To me, though, this is saying this will lead us into a closer relationship with Jesus, more than it means that it's going to lead us into propositional truth. But again, God's word is infallible, mine isn't, so you can agree with me or not, and I'm okay with that. Anyway, I do love the Tree of Life version, and because it's written by Messianic Jews, it gives us the Jewish perspective. Most other versions are filtered, I already said this, but I was living. But all of them are different interpretations of different languages, so you have to be careful and read multiple ones to help out. The original New Testament autographs, an autograph is a fancy word for saying the closest thing we've got to a real writing, and most of these are you know, ancient scriptures. But that's the closest we have, and those are primarily in Hebrew for the Old Testament and in Greek for the New Testament. All right. Verse 1. In verse 1, how does your version describe Peter? What's his title there? An apostle of Jesus Christ. Anybody have anything else different? Did you notice? Hmm? An emissary. An emissary. Okay. And that's the one I read that said emissary. And those are the only two I saw, but I didn't look at everything. An apostle comes from a Greek word that basically means a messenger. It's one who is sent out. And that's good as far as it goes, but most of us think of a messenger as not having authority. An emissary is one who, it does have the implication of having more authority, and it is one who is sent on behalf of someone. Um, messenger in English doesn't have that kind but apostle is a good translation, because even though it is based on just one who was sent, we've attached that meaning of authority to apostle. So both of them are fine translations. But emissary is one that you may or may not have seen before here, and that is a good word to use too. All right. All right, going on, still in the same verse, how does your version describe the dis dispersed followers of Yeshua? To the pilgrims of the dispersion. Pilgrims is what we're not looking for. Anybody got anything under pilgrims there? Strangers. Strangers. Aliens. Strangers, aliens, pilgrims. That's a, that's a good collection. Let's look at those. The translation I have is sojourner, which again is kind of a, a good word for it because it indicates a temporary visitor that's on a journey, that's not a settler. Strangers is interesting because they are not part of the society. The pilgrims usually implies that they are seeking 
something. And if it's God, these folks already have God. So pilgrimage uh, is a little less accurate in the sense that it's not really. Again, that points to the different versions and give you different words, and all of them are good to see. Uh, the diaspora is uh, the root word of that is dispersed. I mean, the English word for that root, excuse me, is dispersed. And this is because the Jews have been scattered throughout the Roman Empire and beyond as a result of persecution. So he's trying to speak to all Jews everywhere, and they are correct that they're the Christian ones that have been persecuted. Verse 2 is a biggie for her hooking us into interpretation issues and into arguments, I think. And it is a, a verse that is often quoted to prove one point in an argument we're going to take a look at. And we could spend all night on one verse, but we're not going to. Thank you. I am going to read the Amplified version for that. And verse 2 goes, who were chosen and foreknown by God the Father and consecrated, sanctified, and made holy by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ, Messiah, and to be sprinkled with His blood. May grace, spiritual blessing, and peace be given you in increasing abundance that spiritual peace be realized in and through Christ. Freedom from fears, agitating passions, and moral conflicts. Now, one of the bigger controversies in our faith through really the last two millennia, and it's been around for a long time, but it got these names more recently, only five or six hundred years ago. But there's a seeming contradiction in our minds between free will, which theologically is labeled like Arminianism, and predestination, which we usually see that associated with Calvinism. And this is a real, I'm going to give you a real simplistic explanation of the difference. You want a better one, talk to Steve after we're through. But I'm not going into this deeply, but if you want to study it, you can for the rest of your life and you'll never get through all the material that's been written. Or if you want to ignore it, I'm going to show you how to do that and get away with it very shortly. So, Jacobus Arminius was a Dutch Reformed theologian in the late 14th, early 15th century. And Arminianism has nothing to do with the country that's known primarily for gypsies and World War I genocide which for a long time I thought, okay, it must have come from Armenia, but they're not really related. But it, it is a, that is an area that's in the old Soviet Union. Armenius, contrary to the belief of some, never said our free will was responsible for our salvation, which you will hear in some of the arguments. But he, he supported the solace of the Reformation, and basically what he said is that free will allowed us to resist God's grace and we can choose not to accept salvation. And Calvinism, on the other hand, leans towards God's grace being irresistible, such that those that are chosen are predestined to be God's people. The Bible supports both of these, which blows our minds to some, again, some extent. Again, this is a pretty simplistic explanation, but I'm not smart enough to give you a complicated one. But our logic, this appears to be contradictory. There are two basic, and I'm going to boil this down to something pretty simple, but there's Aristotelian logic, and that's what we have. We look at something and say, okay, it's this or it's that. We can look at that black, black wall and say it's white, or we can say it's black and blue. I don't know. Which one's right? <coughs> that sounds like it can't be both, but we do in this case have a little bit of both back there. But Aristotelian logic doesn't allow contradictions. 
The brave object, on the other hand, does. And the simplest way to look at this is really that an I rule is it's either or. But in Hebraic logic, it's both and. Two things that seem contradictory can both exist. And we don't have to figure out why that's so. We just trust God with it. Which, if we did that with all the things we argue about in church, we would be one as Christ prayed that we would be. All righty. Uh, all the three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach. In His great mercy, He caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Mashiach Yeshua from the dead. An incorruptible, undefiled, and unfading inheritance has been reserved in heaven for you. By trusting, you are being protected by God's power for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 3 continues reinforcing our place as chosen by God. And in verses 4 and 5, it gives us the consequences of our faith in Christ Jesus. So we see, you know, we are chosen by God. And that is true. And we choose God. That is true. And the two come together to bring us into His kingdom. And the consequences of that is we have a place in heaven reserved for us where everything that is isn't perfect will no longer exist. And all that requires of us is to trust Him and expect His power to protect us through this life because we have that salvation and we can rely on it. And it's revealed in the last time. I don't think anybody's going to argue with you that we're in the last time. Of course, this was the last time as well. And it, that was true for them. Verses 6 and 7. You rejoice in this greatly, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. These trials are so that the true metal of your faith far more valuable than gold which perishes, perishes though refined by fire, may come to light in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach. All right. Um, and I also have to eat. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you don't see Him now, you trust Him and are filled with a joy that is glorious beyond words, receiving the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Life is full of trials. You might want to argue with that. I didn't think so. And we rejoice in those trials in God's grace and the gift of salvation. You might want to argue with that. How many of you rejoiced in the trial today? I tried with them. There's almost always something going on that we're not, well, there is. There's always something going on we're not aware of. Even when we think we've got it, we're, we don't. And my life verse actually reflects this, John 16, 33, where Jesus said that, you know, I've told you these things so that in me you can find peace. But in this life we will have tribulations. And this is grand version of pulling a little bit from everywhere. But you can be of good cheer because he has overcome the world. So Jesus is saying pretty much the same thing we see here. That life's going to be tough, but God's good and he's taking care of the outcome. If you haven't seen my t-shirt, that's four words spoil that down. And I'm almost always happy with things that are well down. Is, uh, well, six verbs. Life is tough. God is good. And both of those are, are true. With life being full of trials, we have to recognize that God has a purpose for those trials. 
It's to test, strengthen, and refine our faith. And it's also to show others Jesus. I'm quoting Steve Brown more than Watts here because he's funny and I love listening to him. But one of the things he said, and this isn't particularly funny, that really stuck with me is that God puts believers through the same trials that unbelievers go through so the world can see the difference. So a Christian will get cancer and a non-Christian will get cancer. If you've ever been in the hospital, you can walk in a room where somebody is seriously ill and almost immediately know the difference, whether they trust God or are trying to trust man. Verses 10 to 12. The prophets who spoke about the grace that was to be yours searched for this salvation and investigated carefully. They were trying to find out the time and circumstances, the Ruach Kamshiai, within that it was indicated. When predicting the sufferings in store for the Messiah and the glories to follow, it was revealed to them that they were providing these messages not to themselves, but to you. These messages have now been announced to you through those who proclaim the good news to you by the Ruach HaKodesh, sent from heaven. Even angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. This, uh, this is kind of fun because you see the prophets are studying the scripture, and I'm sure they're seeking answers for themselves. But it says clearly in this passage, no, they were doing that, or at least God's purpose in it is they were doing that for future generations. And that is a lot of times why we don't see clearly what's going on in our lives, because we're trying to do it for ourselves, or maybe for our children, but not for future generations and not for someone else. <clears throat> Excuse me. God has worked, has worked throughout history for the good of His people and for His glory. That's a, a given. And generations build on one another to advance the kingdom of God. Angels know God far better than we do. And, and they are excited to see what He is doing in and through us. So, you know, if you Think of angels as being above humans in power and in closeness to God. That's true. But in importance to God, we're at least equals, if not superior to the angels. So we have to see things in the context of the kingdom and what God, God is doing through us and not expect to see the results. The results are up to Him, not to us. And I had lost my power here, but I wanted to close that part with, you are important. You are a child of God. And we really need to hold on to that, particularly in the trial, trials when we think he's deserved this. That's never the case. Verses 13 to 15. So brace your minds for action. Keep your balance. And set your hope completely grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach. Like obedient children, do not be shaped by the cravings you had formerly in your ignorance. Instead, just like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves. Also in everything you do, for it is written, Kedoshim shall be, for I am Kedosh. Be holy, for I am holy. We need to brace for action. Why? Because we are in a world of war. It is the kingdom of God against flesh. Against the powers that are behind the fleshly things. Keeping your balance. I found that kind of interesting there. Because there are times in war to attack. Times to withdraw. There are times to go on a flanking action. 
And the best generals in war mix these things up so they're unpredictable. The enemy does that to us. But we should be predictable in that we are following God. But that will look different day to day, moment to moment. So brace for action and expect orders from your commander in chief. And he will give them to you. And if you're not expecting them, he may give them to you, but you're likely to miss them. We need to be braced for the action and ready. And we don't need to be distracted by the stuff of this earth. It says here we want to set our hope and our, and our focus and plot on God's grace. And what that will mean when Jesus returns. It's the common expression of, you know, I read the end of the book and we win. If we can focus on that final victory, the battle is going to difficult can be weathered and weathered with grace and with joy. Verses 17 to 20. If you call on him as father, the one who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, then live out the time of sojourning in reverent fear. You know that you were redeemed from the feudal way of life handed down from your ancestors, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with precious blood like that of a lamb, without defect or spot, the blood of Moshiach. He was chosen before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Okay, well there is a, a shot for the free will sign there. Anybody pick up on it? If you call on him as father, then he will judge impartially. Sort of implies that he may be partial. And we are, need to appreciate that. That is what grace is. And mercy is not seeing what the bad things we've done and being forgiven of them. Grace is receiving what we don't deserve. And I'm good with that. The uh, one of the things, again, and I think they use the word here, we're called to live out as sojourners. We are a sojourner. That is, we are in a world that is not our own. We are in enemy territory, if you want to look at it that way. And we are. And we need to live in reverent fear. I was raised Presbyterian. Reverend was a big word in the Presbyterian church. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard speaking above a whisper in the sanctuary. I know I never did. I was terrified of that. I saw that as being reverent, but it is far more than that. The, uh, the term reverend has a lot of meaning, meanings. It is normally considered solemn. You know, we're not jumping with joy, which is something we do here. But that can also be reverent if it is has the right focus of God. It is honoring. It is respectful. All things we want to do for God. And it also implies awe. And not the awesome that everything is these days. A reverent awe, which is I guess the best way to put it is being totally blown away by God. And fear. Now fear is a word that we have a lot of usage of in very many different circumstances of meaning. And one of the first ones that I, I, I use fear frequently, even though it's not truly fear. I got afraid I'm not going to have enough material for tonight, even though I thought I had way too much. Is that a fear? Yeah. It's using the word. We have fear. I was speaking a little bit about my weirdness with sounds. 
that invokes that fight or flight mode for ready if it is bad enough. And it's irritating if it's not, but that is a true form of fear. But that is the kind of fear that, while, while natural, it really only applies in the natural world. And that's not the fear we want to have for God. You know, that there are many people that fear God and act in such a way that they're expecting him to be the mean kid with the magnifying glass waiting to see you know, who he can torch. One of the pictures I saw on the time that stayed in my brain. That's not God. God's loving. That, that's the enemy. But we sometimes want to put that level of fear on God. And if I don't do the right thing, He's going to hit me with a lightning bolt. Nobody's ever heard that before, right? Even knowing it isn't true because of His love for us, it still feels that way sometimes. And that's not the fear it's talking about. Uh, either. The one that for me at least comes closest, the only one I've ever thought of and considered fear, had to do with my earthly father. He loved me unconditionally, so I wasn't afraid of losing love for him. He was a wonderful example of unconditional love. Nothing close to the unconditional love God has for us. But he loved me, and I knew I wasn't going to do anything to lose that. But my fear of him, my fear surrounding him, is I bore his name. I'm, I'm James Ewart Graham III, and he was Junior. And my grandfather, I had the same fear for. I didn't want to dishonor the name that I was under that was theirs. I didn't want to disappoint them with my actions. And I feared disappointing my father. That's the closest example of, to me what a holy fear or reverent fear is. And it's not wanting to disappoint the one that we owe everything to. Alrighty. Verse 18, uh, we're back to one of my favorite topics. I touched on it last week and probably hit it once tonight. But it's comparing the eternal things to the temporal things. What is part of the kingdom and what will pass away is part of earth. And their relative value. Now, as I opened up last week, I'm a real fan of gold. And I have some. And it specifically says gold here is corruptible. But in a physical sense, it's one of the least corruptible things there is. It's very hard to get gold to combine with anything. It doesn't tarnish. It maintains its shine. Especially after it's been refined, which was a reference here. When you have pure gold, it is going to last a long, long time. But not forever. And to me, I found it poignant here that the comparison is to a silver, not, not as great as gold or platinum, but it, it is as a, these precious metals were common, everybody knew them. And they were, to a large extent, the basis of a solid part of their society. You could rely on gold, you could rely on silver in the flesh. And it's saying that, you know, that they mean nothing in eternity. And the old joke about the guy that insists on going to heaven with his packs of gold because he was very prosperous on earth. He finally got permission from St. Peter. This is not theologically correct. So don't go after him. But when he got there, he has two big suitcases full of gold, which you couldn't carry on earth, so that falls down too. But he gets there and St. Peter said, what you got there? He says, gold. And he said, all right, come on in. And then he turns to an angel and says, well, I don't know, you bring payment. 
<laughs> Gold in heaven is transparent, which I'm looking forward to seeing that. We get a pink here, but it, it is a the best description we can get of heaven are things like that, all the gemstones, the things that are beautiful to us here. But they are going to pale in comparison with the reality that we get there. So focus on the eternal things. One of the, I'll share, and this hit me as, well, anything I remember hit me pretty hard because I don't remember much of it. But I heard this 15, 20 years ago, and if you talk to me much, you've probably heard it from me. But it is a, a description of our life on earth. And it says that the time we spend on earth is like a miserable night, one night in a miserable hotel when it's compared to our life, I believe that loyally. One night we can get through here. Well, if we look at our entire life and think of it as one miserable night in a cheap hotel compared to eternity, that probably pales in comparison. Almost certainly does. But that is what the temporal is compared to the eternal. So look towards the eternal things. And that doesn't mean that having resources is a bad thing. We need to ignore all that and become monks and do nothing but pray. We are, our real calling is to be sinners, which means we have to move through the world. And we have to share the gospel. Uh, this also came back a little bit, these verses came back a little bit to the predestination. And that he was chosen for our redemption. Before time, God had chosen Jesus to be our salvation. And that is in preparing for the end. And I don't know if anybody picks up on that. I wonder if there's an uh, olive top here. Because that is Jesus at the beginning, Jesus at the end. And if there's not, there could be. That's not exactly what's being addressed there. All right. I think I ran 21 through 25 because I was concerned about how many pages of notes I had. Which is even more surprising since it was small font. And it's read on here. Well, actually, I just started with 21. And we'll get to the rest. Though through him you are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your trust and hope are in God. Now that you have purified your souls in obedience to the truth, leading to sincere brotherly love, love one another fervently from a pure heart. He made it possible to believe. So that's kind of leaning towards the predestination again. And God raised him in glory so that we can believe and place our trust, faith, and hope in the only place that it belongs, in God. Now, verse 22 is classic. And it is important, but it can easily be misinterpreted as salvation through works. Now you have purified your souls in obedience. Our obedience purifies our souls, right? That is what it implies there. But no, it's obedience to the truth, and it changes our heart, and God's going to want to do that. So you have to kind of be careful about reading the English and expecting it to be totally accurate. It will always be, as I point out earlier, an interpretation. Somebody human has interpreted God's words here. And you need to compare anything you read anywhere to what the Bible says in the context of that same truth, that same positional <coughs> truth. And if it 
conflicts with other parts of the Bible, recognize that, okay, my understanding is incomplete on this. Not a, I'm going to go shove this down everybody's throat so they will be as spiritually aloof as I am. That's Pharisaism in its worst form. But what I love about this verse, and why I said it's classic, is that we have purified souls through obedience. What does Jesus repeatedly say in his teaching about how we show love to God? If you love me, keep my commandments, be obedient. So where does obedience lead, according to this verse? To love. And where does love lead? To obedience. It's, the Bible speaks to that connection enough from both directions that it shows us this is really a cycle that we need to get in. Love, obedience. Obedience, love. Love, obedience. One produces the other. If we love God, we're obedient. If we are obedient, we love God. And, and that's a it's an infinite circle with Jesus that we need to hop on and run on that cycle. We will have a pure heart, we will have a pure soul because of what He did for us. That's where it comes from. And because we have responded in obedience and love. Our response to the love of God needs to be love and obedience. And the cart, which is the cart, which is the horse, God's the horse. We can't do any of that without it. That's not a bottom argument. So if you're saying, you know, I've earned my salvation because I've chosen Jesus, you're wrong. Jesus chose you. And because of that, we've responded in love. 23 through 25. You have been born again. Not from perishable seed, but imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. For all humanity is like grass, and all its glory like a wildflower. The grass withers, and the flower falls off. But the Word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the Word that was proclaimed as good news to you. And here we are, one more time, on the comparison of the temporal life, which is, as I said, a miserable light in a cheap hotel compared to the glorious life in eternity with God. And that is the only good news. It's the best news. But there is no news that comes close to comparing to the fact that you are prepared for eternity with our Lord and Savior. So we are born for that incorruptible. Not the corruptible that we beat ourselves, or at least I do, and I suspect I'm studying. I know at least one more of you do. Oh, we'll see what we do. But we beat ourselves up because we live in corruption, in a corruptible world. But we have been created incorruptible. We have had that seed of the good news planted in us. And we are set for an eternity of no more self-doubts and no more failures. It will be a time. I think it's a time of adventure. You're going to hear different versions of heaven from everybody that's speculating on that. Because the Bible is not absolutely clear. And I jump on that because the gate is open. You know, if we're in the New Jerusalem, lots of gay on each other. So we can go out and have fun and have adventure and fellowship. So that will be eternal. But that's my worship. God will give us all far more than we can imagine in that time. And we'll let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, 
we are yours, not because of anything we've done, but because we've responded to what you've done. And you owe us nothing, but you've given us everything. And our only reasonable response to that is loving you and being obedient to your work. And by loving others, we are compelled to share this good news with all. So help us each to look for every opportunity, every moment of every day, until the time we are called home to be with you and live incorruptibly forever. We love you, we praise you, we pray these things according to your will. In the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.